Hello, welcome to the late night illo talk. I guess That's Josh right. just did a show and we're like not done hanging out yet, so we're gonna do yeah, this. Yeah, because we're crazy. Um, <laughs> we don't sleep a lot. I don't know if you guys have gathered this, but uh, we are like uh, art students in our lack of sleepiness. I had a is- student, I had a student who's one of my favorite students, he is amazing. And almost everything he does, and he he was asking me because he just got a job before he graduated. So he was like, he's like they they said that they would like they want me to work ten hours a week, you know, until I graduate at the end of the semester, and then they'll take me on full time or whatever. But he's like, how do you how do you do all the things that you need to do? And I was like, well, just <laughs> so do we're gonna talk about it. And I was like, you know, sometimes I take a. I eat lunch for 10 minutes and then I, and then I take a 45 minute nap, you know, yep, like naps. You, you gotta kind of, you know, kind of play. Naps are not a trick I had learned in art school. Unfortunately, I just would like crash and burn and then like do, you know, four nights without sleep. And I'd imagine that's probably how you got through your masters so quickly. Um, but like nap, it, the, the napping thing uh, is a fine art that you learn as a parent. It's like, this, uh, you know, I, I do think that's one of those arts you have to learn as a parent, you know, yeah. during that sleep depth period. And then you're like, naps are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah those 10 minute naps. To, you kind of have to do it. I love it. It's crazy. Um, that That is interesting, though, because I do remember in art school, um, and this is like pre-graduate school, because when I think back to like graduate school, like working on an MFA, like the body of work and the time you have to make it um, be between like the two shows. Cause there's usually like two shows. There's like your advancement show and that's where your committee assesses whether you're even going to be able to get the F in the degree. (laughs) Right. And then you have to start a totally new body of work. So it's like you're crunching like so much work into like one or two semesters and uh, not sleeping and working on a thesis paper and trying to figure out this weird like MLA formatting and nonsense. And and also trying to make it coherent and interesting and analytical of your work and then make work that's informed by that stuff. And it's like, there's all this balancing and juggling. And it's like, thinking back on that, I have no idea how I got through it. And I, I think you've had similar sentiments, but with BFA, I felt like I was working hard, but in retrospect, I have never worked harder in my life than I did the first year out of school. Yeah. See, I, I've had a drastically different experience because I just, um, I was teaching when I got my master's and to get my master's was to like move from a temporary spot to a permanent spot, which took six years after my master's, but I got there. Right. But, uh, and then, during my master's, it was crazy, but it wasn't an MFA. And I never did a BFA because I was um, business track. So I was like communication uh, as my undergrad. I, I, I got my I got my uh, bachelor's degree in communication with a, um, a minor in business marketing. And I'm my- just so mi- – I'm so mystified by – like I and I, do, I hope this doesn't sound bad. It's – you you your work looks like somebody who got a bfa um, um no you i i took one you know what i mean i i don't know what you mean because i i really fight imposter syndrome but um but no i took one one um one 100 level intro to design class from the comm department that was a hundred percent of my training for the first 14 years of my career. Um, and so I just learned everything on the job. Wow. That's- I mean, I was also a TA for that class. So, I mean, you know, I sat through three different professors teaching it multiple times for like a couple semesters. So there was some reinforcement of those principles and then like, fixing other people's garbage and, and critiquing people. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. And stuff, but like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what I was, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I mean, you know, when you and I were both on Threadless, that's why you got 
you got shirts and I sucked is because I, that that's how I taught myself like Adobe Illustrator, for example, I, I taught myself Adobe Illustrator by trying to make t-shirts and they are bad, but I learned the software and I learned a little bit more on design. Yeah. Well, honestly, uh, threadless, like I, like most of the early designs I did felt like were terrible because I, I had been, you know, even coming into that from, uh, the standpoint of like, a um, just because most of what we worked on was like illustration that's like pictorial. So it's like, you're not usually like working on stuff within borders or frames. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you learn how to do these great like splash page illustrations, but I, I, I hadn't really learned like the art of like designing a t-shirt. So the first view I did just looked like an iron on, you know, where right. I was like, it's like in a box and just on a shirt and it, it took me a while to like learn. And a lot of that was the hard way on the old school internet where people didn't pull punches. They'd just be like, this sucks. Like you need to <laughs> right. even the, and, and I mean like now it's like the people who do that quite often aren't really out for your own good. Like, but, it, yeah. but, it, but back then it was like a lot of those people like sincerely wanted to see you level up so you could get a print. And so right. like, they'd be like, dude, next time you do a t-shirt design, like show the shirt color, like through it. And like, use the shirt color as a color. And then like, uh, you know, people don't like boxes on shirts. So like try to design it in an elegant way where it doesn't feel like an iron on. Yeah. And so then I'd start playing with that stuff like that, but still like most of my early ideas were terrible. Um, yeah, yeah, well, my ideas were bad and my designs were bad. My illustrations were worse. So what do you feel? Cause you were, pretty self-taught on a lot of that stuff. And it's like, what do you feel uh, was what allowed you to be able to level up? You know, because like, once again, I wouldn't like seeing your work, I wouldn't think like you're a person who didn't specifically study like illustration and graphic design, you know? Um, yeah. Does that make I, sense? Like, yeah, it, 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 I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, I mean, I, I did graphic design professionally for a decade before I started drawing. Um, you know, well, that's I, it. I did, I did video, you know, yeah. um, I did, I was a professional photographer for several years. Um, so that's how you composition. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's composition and layout and, and lighting. Yeah. Lighting. And, you know, like, I mean, you're like when I, when I took on photography, <clears throat> you know, I binged, everything that I could possibly read on the internet about photography. And I watched every video that was available and I became a member of like the strobist community, which is like an old blog spot, um, an old blog spot thing, you know, but like I, I did everything that I could possibly do, um, you know, to become part of that community. You know what it is, Corey? I think it's that thing we've talked about that's frustrating for teachers, which is hard to teach, which is just you have the drive to, like, actually learn it. Yep. I mean, I just, yeah, I, I didn't want to – I'm not interested in doing something and being bad at it. Yeah. And I'm willing to be bad at it long enough to get good at it. So it's kind of like that that paradox of, like, I, I don't let my I don't let my drive to be good at something um, get in the way of getting good at something. That is so good. That's so well put. Frank is joining us. How's it going, Frank? Hey, Frank. Did you um, like our conversation? Uh, I I will. I really want to say, like, I think Rick came out awesome on there because he's a rad dude and he's yeah. he's he's seriously like one of the most fascinating people to like sit across from and just have a conversation with. I feel bummed that there was so much uh, interruption on our connection because I like, I, so I hope it was as awesome um, as, as it was for me, like for you guys to hear it because Rick is like uh, just profoundly talented and thoughtful. And uh, I was just stoked. And I, I didn't mention this on this, on the stream, but he also did that as a pinch hit even though he's a guy I've been wanting to have on our thing for a long time. Uh, we had our other guests um, booked and they had their COVID shot 
and it, and we're having a bad reaction from it, which happens sometimes. Um, so that guest like asked like, Hey, can, can I skip? Like, I hate doing it. Like, and he's a rad dude too, but it's like, he's, you know, feeling completely terrible for the yeah. day, you know? Right. And, and so like, I, like Rick is just somebody I was just like, dude, will you be on our show thing? And he's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> like I thought I was going to have to like convince him or something. Cause he's, he's a busy guy. I mean, he's like the chair of the program and like, he's doing a lot of freelance and stuff, but he just instantly agreed. And I, I um, so I want to thank him as well because it's like, he, he also pinch hit. Uh, and, and I feel like we got a really good guest, you know, for um, which is funny. Cause that's how some of, some of the guests that I've just hesitated on asking that are like people I've wanted to get on, um, it, I, like end up getting on that way where I'm just like pressured to do it. So I'm like, okay, who else have I wanted to get on here for a while? And yeah. then I, you know, that's actually how I ended up asking David Chelsea too. He's a guy I knew in Oregon. And then I was like, it's that imposter syndrome thing where I'm like, yeah, but he wouldn't want to be on our, like my show, you know, right. that kind of thing. And then I'm like, ask him. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, like I'm sure. our show, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but it's, I mean, you've, you've had like some pretty amazing artists on you, on your um, thing too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the Kevin cross vibes you got are very dead on. There's a certain, like there's, there's a, it's hard to explain, but there's like a, like Kevin knew this when he first met me too. Like I don't skateboard anymore, which I know to a lot of skaters, like, you know, um, turns them off because it's like skate or die. You skate till you're, you know, ancient. <laughs> but, uh, but I used to skate a lot and there is this weird thing that happens. Um, and it has happened in my life since skateboarding where when I meet somebody who's around my age and they skateboarded, like it, and it's just like there's this weird connection and i can't explain it it's not like we we don't connect going like do you skateboard it's just like there's <laughs> there's a personality to it um and and i think that's like why rick and i became friends I, and i feel like that kind of personality like i don't know what it is but it like it, i tend to be friends with people like that not that all my friends skateboard but it's just like there's this bond of either comics or skateboards or like punk rock like that just kind of or hip-hop that like it's that ties in all my friends i don't know it's not like i seek it out either it's just a weird thing but i agree they do have a, a similar vibe we actually did have him uh when kevin and i used to do big illustration party time we had uh rick on as a guest uh back then so yeah anyhow but I actually also wanted uh, him to meet Corey because I'm like, he's he's a Corey type as well. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, there's just a, I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, he's yeah. he was awesome. I'd love to talk to him more when there's not a lag. Yeah, same here. Um, and I also feel like uh, there's, there's a certain kind of person who's like into like rambly, um, philosophical conversation. <laughs> and then, and I think that's uh, I don't know. I, I think he fits well in that in that that group of of people. Yeah, I, I don't would know. Agree. But yeah, um, let's see. <laughs> Frank was saying David Chelsea skateboards. I don't think David Chelsea was a skateboarder. How David and I became friends was um, uh, so my friend Mike Getziv who's like an abstract uh, indie cartoonist that uh, he was editing this anthology that ended up never coming out. But at the time it was signed through dark horse. And so he was getting all of these contributions for this book called snow stories that he was putting together. And he had uh, hired David Chelsea to do um, a contribution for it. And then for some reason, before we were friends, like he had sought me out at a convention to like do a, a short for it, um, for the anthology. And then through that, like I was, I started, when I moved to Portland, I started hanging out with Mike and then Mike introduced me to David and David and I clicked on being like really interested in like crazy old timey music. Um, and like, 
sort of more like bonding on like old movies and stuff. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing, but, and also on comics, like we, we like a lot of the same comics. I, uh, I think if David Chelsea skate skated, he would have done it in a three piece suit. Yeah. I'm like, David would skateboard and he would do it. Like somehow the skateboard would just move and he wouldn't even need to kick it. It would just <laughs> like kind of like, perambulate forward but but i mean the other thing is i think david chelsea actually did like kind of punk rock aesthetics and stuff i think that's part of the suit thing weirdly enough so yeah um, that makes sense. yeah so like uh that's that's where we bonded was like on just being really into um also being really into auto bio comics and stuff and uh and then like it was weird because i hadn't even connected him with david chelsea in love for some reason which I had read in like the nineties. And I, it was the first time I went and hung out with him in his studio and we were drawing and he has this like gorgeous studio. It's like a, so his house, like the whole top floor is a, it's like a daydream studio for an artist where there's skylights in the roof. So it's natural light just coming in during the day. It's a really cool studio to work in. Um, but I'm in there, I'm feeling like pretty surreal about it, you know? And then, um, because he's just such a cool dude and such a talented artist. And I'm looking at these like globes he's made that are like these crazy perspective things. And then it dawns on me, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You did David Chelsea in love, which was like one of the, um, I just, for, it's stupid because his name's in the title, but I was like, <laughs> Oh, like that's, that was like a real um, important book when I was younger. Like that's one of the books that got me really into auto bio. Oh, that's cool. So, um, but David and Chelsea and I becoming kind of friends and stuff. It, it was, that was mostly how it happened was like, we just had a common bond and a common aesthetic, I think. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, most, most of my, but you know, David and I are like friends, like kind of who hung out and drew together a bit, but like Rick and I were like really tight friends, you know? Um, right. I don't know if that makes sense. It's, it's a weird thing. Yeah. Makes and then most of my, like literally most of my friendships though, like my long lasting friendships in my life came from comics, um, which is really strange. So like yeah. uh, even that guy, Jake, that I write about in um, two stories who taught me how to cuss. Uh -huh. That's like one of my closest friends. And then his older brother is the Josh that I played in bands with all the time. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. That. So it's like that friendship was comics and then my friendship with josh was based on a bond over punk rock <laughs> because i was hanging out with his little brother and then uh he took me for a drive to like get food or something we went to get fast food um and he's like the cool older brother who's like disaffected and he puts on uh I'm forgetting the cd but it's like a punk album and i was like i love this album we talked about it in the band and then he was like you're all right you know like it was one of those things so yeah i don't know about you like what what usually causes you to like kind of find a like bond with have you ever found something like that like a weird common thread with people you befriend um no i don't know maybe <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know that I've really thought about it. I have to think about it a lot more. We have we have a discussion going on, and I found I love the it. graphic while you were talking. Oh, uh, oh, uh, I love that. That graphic is yeah. great. Uh, I made this. I think it was. I think Jake, it was during during my hundred days of animation. Jake still owes us a night gang graphic too. So. I know, right? Just saying, Jake. Come on, night gang graphic. So, Corey skateboards and listens to punk? Question mark. I will say I, uh, <laughs> in college, I dated a girl who's way cooler than I was and she longboarded. So I never skate, I never skateboarded because I had a, uh, an old, like, I can't even remember what the brand was, but it was like the cheap Kmart brand. Um, and I had it like when I was five and I was kind of getting into it. And then my little brother left it behind my parents' car and it got run over. And that was the last skateboard I owned until college when I bought a longboard and we'd like bomb hills. So it's like a drastically different crowd and a drastically different aesthetic and 
and personality uh, than like than like the vert ramps and the and the pipe guys and the short boards. Um, so I I can't claim skating, um, but I do have some scars from bombing some some pretty steep hills. Um, and I do listen to punk and metal and uh, like, but most of my punk is probably like considered like pop punk. Um, I listen to a little bit of like Ramones and like some old school stuff, but most of my punk is like, uh, you know, like early 2000s, like pop punk. I like, uh, you know, I, I like Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy and Sugar Cult and a lot of emo stuff like Juliana Theory and stuff like that. There's some older stuff, um, yeah. like the Vandals and stuff like that. So it's not like Josh is like a real punk and I'm like, I'm like, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just for some, like that's the thing. I'm not like it's not like I'm like some hardcore real punk. It's just a <laughs> it's just a weird thing where there's like these different common threads. I mean, with Corey yeah. and I, I think we're friends. I think that would be a friendship that started over comics, and uh, and then yeah. we just found out that we're also like weirdly similar in the sense of like we'll be in a conversation and randomly bring up like the French Revolution and right. it's like <laughs> the second like I hung out with court like the I think it was the first time we had him on art casters and I was like oh he's like drawing parallels with like like uh, you know um, I think it was with the French Revolution I was like this guy's like my speed like that's that's <laughs> the way my mind works so it's yeah. like it I just um, for me like that's what I, I relate to where I'm like I just like nuanced complicated but not pretentious um, yeah. stuff and like i i kind of think uh like for me that that's that's one of the things you know but it definitely started i mean it probably i can't say it didn't start with comics because it totally did i mean scott scott found me um and had me on he's he said he had me on because on my 100 days thing i bothered to do like animated graphics <laughs> Um, and he's like, oh, that, that branding looks good. And so he had me on from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was about the time I was binging uh, great courses on uh, ancient Sparta and ancient Egypt and the French Revolution. So, yeah, that sounds about that sounds about right. So, yeah. Um, but I will I will say every time you start talking about like philosophy or history or whatever i i think you have read five times the books that i have on on that type of stuff because like you're like it's you have you have this habit of doing something that cracks me up where and it's very complimentary you assume that everybody else is as smart as you are and so you're like you know and then you mentioned some like super obscure highly intellectual like theory by name and just assume that I know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, you know, the blah, 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 blah. And I was like Googling I, it as we were talking. I uh, did, nope, don't know that one. <laughs> I didn't actually, I didn't know I did that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and what you describe it. And I just, I do tend to assume people like, I don't know. Cause I don't really think of myself as like somebody who's really well read, you know, like, so that that would probably really be. yeah i i mean i mean i read i've read a lot yeah, but sure like i i was a book nerd as a kid but it's like you know if i talk to like an ethicist i feel like totally out of my depth you know because i'm like i kind of i kind of read some stuff on ethics but like i have to remind myself of like like what is epistemics again like i you know like every <laughs> once in a while i'll have to like look into like these things to like refresh my brain, you know, on it. Cause it's been a while. And also I haven't read that much on it, you know? And I'm like, you know, I'm the, I'm the hobbyist of a lot of different disciplines. I, I, I feel like I'm a, I think that's something we have in common. Honestly. Yeah. No, but, you know? but I feel like your level of hobbyist is maybe a little bit more in depth than mine. Cause I'm like, I'll read a Wikipedia article and then kind of go down a rabbit hole, but I don't like, go to the sources like i've never actually read sart you know or or any of those guys i've heard lectures about them oh okay you know, well, I mean? read, so, you know yeah 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 
So there's a, there's a difference because I'm going off of you know other people's research rather than primary research, and you've actually gone in and like, you know, I mean, I've read some, um, you know, like Kafka stuff like that, but but nothing. Yep. By the way, like you don't need to read Kafka. This is for anybody in the audience. You just need to look up home movies, uh, Franz Kafka, the musical. Um, what? Now I have to do that. You haven't seen this? No. Uh, I mean, will I've it get you demonetized? I want you to like look it up right now. It's a song. It's amazing. <laughs> but I also well, don't I'll want do you it, to I'll do it like... after the stream's over. So that okay. Uh, so Frank likes the Vandals. Um Favorite album of the Vandals? I'm kind of curious, Frank, because mine is uh, Hitler Bad, Vandals Good. That's one of my favorite. Just the name of it is good, and like almost every song in that album is like rad. That's great because uh, that actually holds up too. For it's relevant for our time. <laughs> it is. Yeah. In case anybody didn't know, um, Hitler is still a bad person. Yes. Um, I was. <laughs> I was just watching a. I was, I've been binging uh, stand-up comedy lately, and I was watching some um, some Bar, Bill Bar, Burr. I can't remember the guy's last name. I think it's Bar. Let me look him up. Oh, man, my favorite is still that bit where, and I always forget. I always blink out. It's Philly, right? That he just destroys. Have you ever so. seen that clip? It's not Bar. It's Burr, right? Yeah, Burr. Yeah, Bill Burr. There we go. Have you seen that clip of him just like ripping a new one to the to the audience for like almost an hour of just like not even making jokes, just just destroying the entire city of Philadelphia? It's amazing. No, I haven't seen that. So it's this it's this notorious show in um in in comedy history because Bill Burr just like so he like is doing this big event. It's, I forget who it was for. It's like, um, yeah, it's Philly incident. Um, and, uh, it was organized by I'm forgetting who, um, it's like these comedy guys, like one of them still on air and funny. And then the other one's terrible um, and not funny at all, but like they used to be a funny duo and I'm t unfortunately totally blanking out on their name, but they, they were these radio jocks, disc jockeys that organize this giant comedy festival. You have all these legends of comedy lined up and Philly is just being terrible to every comedian that comes up and just booing them off the stage and stuff. So by the time Bill Burr comes on and he's just like, doesn't even want to try to do comedy. He's just like, I'm not even going to do a bit. I'm just going to like, he's like, you guys are all entitled. And then he just starts shredding people. Like he's just like you. And like, he starts <laughs> singling out people in the audience and just destroying them. Like it's, it's like, it's the most um, brilliant, uh, like just amazing thing you'll ever see. Um, yeah. awesome. Oh, dude, <laughs> Adam has seen the home movies. Uh, Living like a bug ain't easy. That's one of the lyrics from the Franz Kafka <laughs> rock opera. <laughs> yeah, I went through a really weird phase uh, where I was I was like reading. I so <clears throat> years ago. Um, I think I also think your experience as an art director is drastically different than mine because uh, you work for a company that like produces art, um, and I work eh. for a company. Well, you know, but I mean, you know, you work for a company where like it's 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 one of the main products that you're putting out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I work for a company where it was used as marketing, and so I kind of had free reign to do whatever I wanted because nobody understood what I was doing. <laughs> but but also we had to put out like a catalog. And so I remember this one summer, um, I literally didn't leave this basement. Um, and apparently my, one of my, one of my former students works there now. And, uh, and I asked her, Hey, is my photo studio still in the basement? She's like, Oh yeah. Untouched like a museum. We go down there and still shoot stuff. But like, like I had like rigged up like, um, paracord, like pulley systems so that I could like adjust the lights without, without leaving my chair. That's amazing. <laughs> anyway, I did all this stuff. So that is one thing. Like all we photograph where I work is like very small items. You know, we have the challenge of metal, which is you have that with a guitar too, where you have multiple textures and reflective textures are really hard to shoot. Oh yeah. Um, because you need like pretty much like you need a light source from every direction to to set off the shadows. 
And like with a smaller item, you can put them in an actual light booth. But with something large like a guitar to get like a really good shot of that, that is not a joke. Like that's hard photography. Yeah, um, it, that's hard product photography right there. Oh, it was it was rough. Um, I and mean, those that, clipping masks, like yeah, it's it's all easy when you're doing the body of the guitar, but you start getting into those like those tuning pegs and. <sighs> yeah, so I I read I listened to amateur amateur. Um, readers so the uh the librivox um have you the librivox project have you ever heard of that no i haven't it sounds so it's, it's like it's, a it, nazi project Corey. <laughs> it is, uh, <laughs> i'm sorry that was trying to be a callback to the vandals thing <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, it's public domain public domain books read by amateur uh narrators and some of them are quite good some of them are using the opportunity to read uh, a chapter of a book as an opportunity to practice their English. And so some of them are kind of hard to get through, but I listened to like fathers and sons, uh, Anna Karenina. Uh, like I listened, I went through a period where I was listening to like Russian romantic era, like novelists. See, like, this, fathers, like once again, if anyone's curious why Corey and I are friends, <laughs> it's, it's the fact that like, he and I are both similar people in the sense of like, what am I going to do today? I'm going to listen to Russian romantic era novels <laughs> for about like half a year and just do a deep dive into that business. Cause that's what I'm going to obsessively do. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I get that. I, like, I totally understand that. Like it was like a, well, you, you were probably remember this, but it was only like a year and a half ago where I was just like, I am going to read the rags and fall of the third Reich. And then I'm going to go down this rabbit hole and read all this depressing stuff about that era of history, because why not? I, uh, I'm still slowly making my way through that book. Well, the reason that I, the reason that I, um, the reason that I chose the Russians was because um, there's not a lot of decent books <laughs> that are on, on that thing that the public domain, right? So, I, I mean, I also read like, um, you know, like, uh, oh, what's his name? Burroughs, you know, with like, I didn't read Tarzan, but I did like the Mars. Oh, I thought, yeah. I didn't know which Burroughs you were talking about. I was like, like the naked lunch? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I read, I read, um, you know, I read like John Carter. And then I, um, I also read, um, oh, who's the guy? It's not Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's the guy who invented the lost world genre. Um, oh, H.G. Wells. No, um, no. Alan, Alan Quartermain, she, uh, you know, uh, King Solomon's, King Solomon's Mines, that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've told me I need to check. H. Ryder out. Haggard. Yeah, you, you've, you've mentioned the, him before and, and recommended him because I, I have not read him. Yeah, so. You see, um, you see, you were just earlier making the charge that I'll reference something. And assume you've read it, and you just did the same thing. I know you're well read, but, sir. You are. But uh, but my, um, the whole the whole point of that was I I just spent this weird summer by myself shooting hundreds of guitars in a basement, forty hours a week, listening to amateur uh, narrators read public domain Russian books. <laughs> And it was like, I came out of that and it was, it was, it was like, it was like my own pandemic. It was like my own lockdown. I came out of that. I remember, I remember like three months later, like I came upstairs and I'm like, there's people that work here. Like I, I, re I remember some of these people. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. So when you came out of the basement, did you notice that you had like turned into a bug like is that what happened after so being what, in there like you came out you're like i don't know why but like my arms look like fuzzy and strange yeah i, I went upstairs and i uh i just picked off one of the beautiful people upstairs and dragged them back down downstairs and ate them <laughs> now this is <laughs> this is a an extremely my eyes got really big and dark uh for some reason um <laughs> Yeah, so if you've watched the 90s X-Men, you might get the reference that we're talking about because I, I had become a Moloch. Mm -hmm. um, 
And by the way, I've finally gotten my son to sit and watch. He watched the first uh, the first X Men and sat all the way through it. The first X Men cartoon that does not hold up, but I still want him to get into it. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm like, it's got the coolest theme song in the planet. It does. It's not great though. Yeah. No, it really. Yeah. I really need somebody to start streaming Batman the Animated Series. I like that we're just going to like pretend reference Time Machine and then not actually mention Time Machine and just move on. Um, but yeah, Frank brings up League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Um, except for Dorian Gray, which I I couldn't make it through that book. That was, that was abysmal. Um, it was just like too much. Anyway, except for that one. I, I went through a period where I was like, I want to find out who these people are. And so I read the comic first and then I went back and I read um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the original novels that those characters were based on. They're, they're quite good. So you, Jake, if you want to. Sorry, you Jake's take, comment. Oh, you got to hit this comment. It's so funny. Oh, sorry. As Corey Kerr awoke one morning from an uneasy audiobook listening, he found himself transformed in his bed into a gigantic guitar. <laughs> or actually, it would have been an electric ukulele. <laughs> right. Oh, man, those were so easy to shoot compared to the, like, Paul Reed Smiths that are, like, just shellacked with gloss. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I'll take a... I'll take a uh, like a satin finish electric ukulele over a, over a, a really shiny, like we had those, um, what's that jazz guitar that's like semi hollow with the, with the F holes. Um, and it's got the huge brass whammy bar on it. It's like really iconic, like a double. Are you talking double. about like a, a Gretsch kind of thing? Yeah. Gretsch. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. had, we carried Gretsch. Oh, wow. The, that's, before Fender owned them, right? Uh, 2009? Can't remember when Fender bought them out. I don't know. but um, Fender, like for anyone out there, I, I like Fender's one of my favorite guitar companies, but they do kind of have a monopoly on like on the guitar industry. Like I was so shocked to find out all the brands they own. Like I think they own Mitchell. They own like some of the biggest acoustic brands. They own like, most of their competitors it's, it's really insane i think other than gibson like if it weren't for gibson i think fender would just be kind of like the owner of like the majority of guitars on the planet at most big box stores or whatever which is which is crazy uh, almost almost to the point where it's a little surprising that they haven't gotten hit by like does the government just not care about antitrust anymore like, <laughs> yeah because that used to, to be say. something that we cared about <laughs> i think um yeah Back and you can the, order my book on Amazon. Not saying there's any connection to what you just said about antitrust and Amazon, but you can <laughs> order my book on Amazon for thirteen dollars right now. It's at a discounted rate and free shipping. <laughs> that is that is good to know. <laughs> Sorry, just we something about that word just made me think Amazon. I don't know why. There's so that's a bizarre connection. connection. I don't know where you're getting that from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean Taylor. Uh, I mean, in the acoustic guitars, Taylor's kind of a holdout. Oh yeah, they aren't owned yet. I don't think anybody owns Taylor. I think Taylor still owns Taylor. But they got big enough to where, like, did do you know Taylor Guitars owns the only two remaining forests that produce ebony wood? I uh, I didn't actually. That's really they, so we oh, okay. So here's this is some inside baseball that no one cares about. But of all the people I know, I think Josh, you would find it interesting. So there's a huge so the Taylor, like the guy who owns owns and founded the company, right? Yeah. Uh, he's like he's like yeah. I was I started getting this. Uh, I started getting this these messages that like um, ebony. Okay, so for those of you that don't know most fretboards are made out of ebony um, and that's because it's an exceptionally hard wood. And so you can like embed these metal frets into it and then scrape metal strings across it and it holds up. Okay. I thought it was um, uh, 
Oh, you're talking about before, like, okay. Uh, you're saying the neck or the or the um, the fretboard? Isn't it the fretboard? Could be the neck. Okay. I thought so it was I, the fretboard. Yeah. Um, it's been I, a few well, years. See, I think I'm confused because, like, I don't know as much about acoustics because it's like there's um there's rosewood. Yeah, rosewood's like a it's real common. Rosewood. But rosewood's banned now, so now they use um. <clears throat> I'm forgetting what the, what it's called, but it's like they they rarely do rosewood. Um, but that's, I think you're right. I think for ukes, I think like an ebony. No, I'm talking, ebony. I'm talking acoustic guitars. Okay. Huh. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think it's ebony. I can't remember. I'm, I'm pretty sure though. But I think anyway. that's a really, <clears throat> I think you're right. I'm going to. Got it. Okay. They're they're hardier and longer lasting than rosewood flat fretboards. Ah, they want a darker neck with a brighter tone. That makes sense. Yeah, here we go. I'm the wondering. Ebony, I think, I think the, the ebony Siegel project I own, Taylor guitars. Yeah, I think the Seagull I own. I wonder if that has ebony or like because I actually, unfortunately, don't know. I mean, they're beautiful guitars, but I should know like the specs. Now this makes me like see this is a rabbit hole you're starting me down. Okay, <laughs> okay. So let me let me tell the story. I'll I'll tell it faster than I was. Yes. So he goes he goes to this. There's like there's like two forests left or one forest left that produces ebony, and it's in um, it's next to this village. And everybody in the village is a logger of this ebony forest, right? And so they maintain the forest, and they go in and. Um, they cut these trees down. It's a huge amount of work and you, there's no way to tell there's like, there's dark ebony, which is what everybody wants. And then there's kind of blonde ebony, which people decided that they don't like. And then there's these trees that are mixtures where there's little spalted spots of blonde mixed in with the dark. And um, <clears throat> they're cutting down these trees and, uh, and, and he goes out there and he says, well, why are all these trees laying on the ground? And he's like, oh, Americans don't like the blonde ebony. And so we just, he goes, well, is there any way to know? Like, it's a huge amount of work. He goes, is there any way to know whether it's going to be blonde or not before you chop it down? And and they're like, no. And so they can, they can spend like a day, day's labor, like working on these trees and get nothing because they just happened to guess wrong. And so he said, what would what would make your lives easier? Um, because I feel like if musicians knew about this, they would care about it. Um, but I don't think anybody knows. I think, I think there's been some assumptions and he said, what would make your lives easier? And, and, and they, he said, is there any difference between the blonde and the dark? Like, is like structurally or anything? And they're like, no, it's exactly the same. Like it's got the same density. It's got the same qualities. Like it's the same wood. It's just a different color. And, um, and so, Taylor guitars. So he said, he said, so this is what I've done. And this was his announcement to the, to the entire music industry. He said, just so you know, I purchased the village and the forest. I <laughs> own so he's just owning the ebony. Yeah. That's he said, I own all the ebony and I'm just letting everybody in the music industry know now that you will accept what you have considered to be imperfect blonde ebony now, because I will release uh, nothing but the wood that if they chop down a tree, we are using it. Like, I don't care. I don't care what color it is. So get used to, get used to multicolored fretboards because, uh, it's ridiculous that we're putting these people through this, this hard labor with no reason or oh, logic what a trip. behind it. And so he just, he just did this and he's like, he's like, I'll tell you what, if, if people don't want, uh, don't want this mixed wood or the blonde wood, then you don't get ebony because I own the only supply. And okay, you can't so this makes this makes so much sense. That's that's so crazy. Okay, so the guitar I have um, is yeah. nowhere near a Taylor. So this is why Taylors use ebony. I mean, that's a really expensive wood. So if right. you look at the entry level price for like a good Taylor, it's somewhere around five thousand dollars. <laughs> and that that's a cheap and one. Right. Yeah, that's a cheap tailor. So that would be why I've rarely heard of ebony on a guitar because I, I like I 
the highest end I'm going to go is something like a seagull or whatever for, for my use. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, the seagull that I have um, has, let's see, what was the fretboard? So oh I'm going to put this link in the chat in case anybody's interested. Jan says that's a great story. So check, check this out. I think the video where he explains it um, and I'm, I am remembering this from, oh boy. That is so cool. 10 years ago. So my memory might be mixing up some of the details, but, but I think the original video where he's just like, I'm doing this, screw everybody. You know, you can either, you can either not have ebony or you can have ebony my way that doesn't screw this village over. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So then my, it, mine is mahogany. Uh, my, my acoustic, my yeah, nice mahogany's, acoustic. Mahogany is a good hardwood. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, uh, it's funny too, because a lot of people don't realize this about acoustic guitar companies like um, Siegel uh, is like a really low priced uh, acoustic that has an, an incredibly high quality, but mm. it's because they're in Canada and they're literally right by the forest that they get the wood from. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and you'll actually notice this, uh, this, this ties into art too, because um, a lot of the really cheap print shops are located near a paper source like like a, a lot of uh the great paper companies are right near the source so it's it's kind of a weird thing but it's like you'll notice like the lower the cost with higher quality tends to be closer to the source it's, it's very strange um but yeah so that thing with like buying out the ebony isn't actually that unusual for like a company that's you know, working in wood. I mean, that it's pretty brilliant, but, right. um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the neat things about like the regional areas that you can get guitars at. Um, what's, what's weird is the guitars I'm most familiar with are electrics and on an electric guitar, generally an electric guitar is going to have like a maple neck and then it's going to have, um, a, uh, uh, um, rosewood fretboard if it's got a fretboard otherwise it'll just be like carved directly into the neck right yeah um and then what's fascinating about that though is uh i'm trying to remember the new wood because rosewood got banned uh for importing a yeah, as did um as did the the um pearl inlays so they're not doing white pearl inlays on necks anymore at least guitars that are uh you mean actual like mother of pearl like alabaster inlays the 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 white um pearl inlays yeah they they can't do anymore so now they use like a it's like a black pearl that's that's something they can export yeah but i'm trying to find well, out what the what the mahogany substitute or not the mahogany um the rosewood substitute is part of part of the problem that nobody realizes is uh that that like good guitars are are um to produce them use exceptionally rare materials 100 percent um it's a little bit of a problem <laughs> well i mean it is it is a problem um i will say though like there's uh like so i have a squire telecaster right and the wood in that is not going to be high quality wood. <laughs> like it's going to be enough to pass it's going to be decent wood but it's not going to be that great yeah. When my Fender Tele American is like the best wood for that model of guitar, like it's the best wood you can have a Tele made of. Okay, uh, other get, than the pure rosewood, which is insane, but there's like this very famous uh, Telecaster. It's one of the most famous Telecasters, and I think it was um, George Harrison had this beautiful Telecaster. The entire neck of the guitar and the body of the guitar was solid rosewood. That is insane. And it's uh, super expensive and I've seen knockoffs of that, but, it, but you're rarely going to see that with a price tag that's under like 10 grand because <laughs> yeah. uh, well, rosewood is expensive. Tell you, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, I, I'm trying to make sure that I don't break NDA. Oh, it's Paul. F so now they use POW pharaoh that's what they're using mm. instead is that a chinese wood uh it says it's a nice fingerboard wood it's usually reddish brown lighter in color than most rosewood with an attractive visible grain 
feels harder and smoother, but it's somewhere between. I don't think it's particular to Chinese China, mm. but I but I I don't know. Um, I do know that it has to do with exports because they they could no longer. And also, I think it has to do with the trees. Like, I think actually the uh, like rosewood is actually a rare, like there's a problem, like like you just described, where it's like if you're manufacturing mass guitars with a rare wood, then that wood's going to become rare. <laughs> right. But yeah, I I I would kill. I mean, I'm sure those tailors play like a dream. You know, acoustics okay. don't so get up there, man. So um, let me let me tell you the secret to acoustics. It's not Siegel. Siegel's a great brand. I do like it's, Siegel. It's Teton Guitars. Oh, well, that's where I you used to work. This, I launched this guitar line, and there are certain things I can't say publicly about it, but I can tell you with the surety that uh, it plays uh, at a at a at a very similar quality to the ten the ten thousand dollar Taylor guitars. But they cost like between one to five thousand dollars, which is still way out of my price range. But I bet they sure. play beautifully. But they've got. Although they've got I don't know, range. I do need to like hit you up, Corey, and see if you can get like a Teton discount for me. <laughs> I'm joking, but I yeah. do like the like. Honestly, I really dig ukulele now, and they do have some really pretty ukes, man. Oh yeah, like just really nice. Nice looking ukes. I'm literally looking at ukuleles right now. Um, but Teton guitars, man, they, these are nice. They look well. I, I I'm not gonna want to give away the secret either, but I can guess what it is. Yeah. So I'll I tell think you, it's a similar uh, secret to some other brands of guitars. They're remarkably similar to some other brands of guitars. Yeah. It's not. So I probably insinuated something that I shouldn't have. It's it's similar to that, but it's not like it's made in the same factory as something else. No, um, no, no. Yeah, but what? But uh, but I'll tell you the the really cool thing about the Teton guitars is they have a floating bridge system as they're bracing, and so what makes an acoustic guitar sound good? One is the wood quality, right? Um, is you know it, it it's going to vibrate, uh, but the other one is um, the way that it's constructed can actually help or hinder the vibration and so what teton does is they have a floating bridge which means if you look inside there instead of having a brace that goes all the way across it's got like arches that goes across and so it's like um, these flying buttresses that just touch the top occasionally and so there's less bracing um it still holds together just fine but there's less things deadening the vibration. So like you can, you can pick it up and strum it and it will vibrate for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so like a long sustain. Yeah. I think um, the other thing that's kind of a trick to an acoustic guitar, I have this really crappy guitar, um, a really great uh, acoustic guitar, guitar companies, uh, Takamine. I'm going to, hmm. I'm pronouncing it wrong, but they, they make beautiful guitars. I've they heard have these, they have these Takamini. I think that that's probably the pr proper pronunciation. And, um, but, but when I was like a poor, like, you know, 17 year old, they, they released these like $90 guitars called Jasmine, which at the time were like for like a cheap entry level, like you're not needing, like you just need something you can play on. That doesn't sound terrible. Like it was a yeah. pretty good guitar. Um, it played terribly. What's weird is it sat in my garage for like a couple years. It got like dust on it. it. It got all messed up. And when I was going through that whole phase a couple years ago where I was like modding guitars, yeah. I would like to get back to it at some point. Um, I, I cleaned the neck. I like reset the intonation. I got new strings. I like changed out the, um, the heads because like the, one of the things on, on cheap guitars isn't always the wood. A lot of the times they'll also skimp on the hardware. So like the wood's fine, just the hardware sucks. Yeah. Uh, so if you have like a, a crappy bone or nut, yeah. I mean, that's what the, your strings sit on. Yep. Yeah. And that can wreck the intonation. So I did all that. I did the pencil trick, like which, you, you know, when, you, when you've got that little, the little uh, ivory or, or plastic part of the nut at the, at the top of the neck, 
Um, you just draw like you can actually buy graphite to do it with, but it's a lot cheaper to just take like a number two pencil and just sketch behind it. Um, and then that gives it a little more sustain. So I did all the, all the tricks and stuff. And then I, I wiped it with oil and cleaned it up and, uh, like redid the tress rod just a little bit on an acoustic. You want to be real careful with it, with the tress. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I have like the, the measurement tool and stuff like that play it and it sounds beautiful yeah and i realized part of why it sounds beautiful and i've done research on this there's a weird thing that happens to acoustic guitars they actually sound better with age yeah and so that's one of the reasons like older acoustic guitars actually accrue in value as long as they're not like super damaged because yeah. what happens when like wood adjusts i mean you know all this because you work through the guitar company but it's weird when wood adjusts as long as it hasn't been completely destroyed by the climate, like as it adjusts and kind of sets to the guitar, like it, it's it sort of like actually grows in tone. So it's almost like wine. So there's mm -hmm. guitars that sound okay. And then like 10 years later, they just sound like a dream. Um, and, and that to me is really cool, but Taylor's are those guitars. <laughs> like that is a good, yeah. good guitar to mention. Those guitars, I mean, that Teton guitar company looks amazing too. I bet those play really good. Whew. Yeah, they're I, good. I would love one of those. We did a, I, we did a lot of work to make sure they were really good. Yeah, well, they look beautiful. Like that that company definitely doesn't look like they they skim for or mess around with wood either. I mean, the wood looks great. Um, yeah, I also like the the kind of Epiphone and and uh, like style guitars, like the large, you know, rockabilly shape ones those are pretty rad um yeah they look great it's good stuff yeah i don't know i don't know anything about them because i don't play so <laughs> I, always, I always feel like uh i always feel like i'm um uh, um like a tourist when i when i start talking about you know it like, sounds like, like you you have more knowledge about a lot of things about guitars than i do honestly and i play but it's like i don't like know all the terms or like the woods and stuff like that and i think that's well, i was like i was the marketing director right yeah you know cool. so like you've got to know well you've still got play. you've still got it Corey, because it made me want to buy the guitar <laughs> <laughs> but i mean my my point is like i you know you have to you have to know enough to write the copy but that does i'm i'm getting all of this from listening to people who know what they're talking about and then being like hey i have to like I have to write an ad about this. So let's go sit down at lunch and you just, you know, I'll just sit down with like one of the luthiers or one of the guys that like repairs the guitars or does the adjustments before we ship them out. Um, Cause like everyone, every single one is like adjusted by hand. Yeah. Um, you know, by like a professional luthier. Yep. So I'd be like, all right, tell me about this. And I just go hang out in their shop for like an hour or two. See that, that would be a really like, I have thought about this. Um, a lot of music companies don't have like the highest pay scales, but I've yeah. been so tempted before. Like I remember I, when, when I, whenever I've ordered from Sweetwater, um, I just, I have these daydreams of like working there because. But I've heard have, like, really good things about Sweetwater's sales team. Yeah. And, and, uh, they hire musicians. They have like kind of a rad environment where you can play music wherever you are. And, and, and like, um, it's just like a very creative, cool environment. And I'm sure the pay scale is not all that great, but it, but I, but I have had daydreams of that. Um, similar to like Fender where I'm like, it would be fun to <laughs> Fender, uh, as much as I was joking about them owning half the guitars in the world, that is in my mind, like the best electric guitar. Like I, it depends on what your tone is and what your style is. And I mean, it's definitely not the most expensive guitar, but to me, like for the kind of music I like playing, I feel like, um, just a, a Fender just makes the best guitars in that, in that category. <laughs> Hold on. Fr Fender, Fender makes good stuff. Uh, Frank says, where can I get a good guitar that won't break the bank? Um, is there a music making starter kit that I can get on surfworks.com? <laughs> Frank's so good at this. Like, I'm sure that's his next digital download is. Uh... 
That's <laughs> awesome. Um, honestly, I will. I'll tell you this: go to whatever local mom and pop shop, not like a guitar center, right? Go to like a locally owned um, music store, and have them call Chesbro Music to to start stocking Teton guitars because they've got some stuff that's down in the less expensive, more like student range. And even that stuff is still pretty decent. Um, if you want to yeah. get like a good, like a, like a guitar, we're going to pay like a hundred to 300 bucks. Um, you know, you can, you can pay the store to set it up for you. And, uh, and that'll make it a little bit better, but like, you're going to have to pay a little bit. If you want to get a musical stringed instrument that is cost effective, then get a ukulele because you can get incredible woods. This is Corey doing his marketing skills in action. Um, and, and it is compelling. And that is a good point. <laughs> Honestly, ukuleles are super, a, a lot easier to learn than a guitar because you have less strings yep. um, and you have less frets to work with. And the chord structures are easy to hold and there's less complicated uh, chords. So um, it, it, and I will say, coming from the standpoint of somebody who played guitar, it wasn't super hard to learn the basics of a ukulele because they're very similar languages. It's just like the only thing that's hard to get used to is like the tuning. Um, but don't get the cheap plastic ukulele that you're going to get no. at like a, because for like $20 more, you can get an entry level crappy ukulele. <laughs> I, I always recommend start on, don't go like, like if I were going to, like I, like for for me like i like seagulls as like a mid-range guitar you know yeah. um, I, I i think that's just a really great like mid-range guitar you're not going to get a much better guitar for around 500 bucks but yeah. when you're starting acoustic guitar if you don't even know if you're going to learn it if you're going to stick with it and stuff like that i think you'd be crazy to go out and buy a 500 hundred dollar guitar um, but i would the one thing that i would spend on yeah good, good machine heads yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. The reason, and the reason for that is, if you're starting to play the guitar, um, it'll go out of tune a bunch. <laughs> it goes out of tune all the time, and you don't know how to tune a guitar because you're just learning. I, I, I would go the opposite and just say, get a crappy guitar with crappy tuners, and then you'll learn how to tune your guitar, and you'll have to do it every ten minutes, and that will train you on how to tune a guitar. <laughs> and then when you when you level up, and you need a new a good guitar. You will know how to tune it. You will know how to treat it right. You will. Here's know how the to deal. Here's the, the deal, though. You have the perseverance, perseverance to fight through that frustration. And That's true. A guitar going out of tune every five minutes is going to kill almost any budding musician. But I uh, will tell you, you. I will tell you, if you're going for an electric, and this is just having done research really recently on this, if you're going for an electric, the best quality low end electric guitar, and we're talking like entry level, it's really hard to match what squire is doing right now that's fenders like subclass um the squire there's the there's a series of squires called the si squire classic series like the or vintage um and uh they're like unbelievable like there's musicians that are right now like quite often talking about get like preferring them to like american fenders and they're remarkably cheaper but they they kind of they up their game a lot. They have higher quality woods. You can get like Jaguar models, Jag Stangs. Like you can get a 1950s style Tele with the same hardware. It's really interesting and fascinating. And if I were gonna do like an entry level guitar, I would go with like an Intro Squire. Even under that, get like a Squire Affinity. They're not bad guitars. They'll teach you how to play guitar. They have decent hardware. They're, you know, at most a couple hundred bucks. And then you can learn if you, if you like guitars, I, I never think like, to me, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't break the bank on a first guitar because your first guitar is going to be like the one you figure out you want to play guitar or not on, you know? Yeah. Um, and also if you do want to get a ukulele, um, ukes have a good entry level. Yeah. And don't, don't price. worry about the backer sides. They, they don't make as much difference as you think, but you can get like a, like a, like a ply back and sides, which means that it's a veneer. Mm -hmm. um, the real important part of a uke is the top. So get a solid top um, and then get, you can get a ply back and sides. 
um, and 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 that'll save you that'll save you a ton and give you a really high quality wood. Um, and then just don't get friction tuners. Get get geared machine head tuners instead of friction tuners. Yeah, friction tuners on like that that is a big deal. Um, don't get a guitar with cheap tuning heads. If a guitar is forty bucks, don't buy it. <laughs> like. Yeah. Um, if, if a uke is 40 but you can get an okay entry level uke for like 50 or 60 um 40 yeah. is gonna stretch it um I'd, I'd say i'd say 75 plus is probably yeah. where you should start like the one i got was like 80 it's not bad yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh the other thing i was gonna say for acoustic guitars though um just start with like a cheap old like hundred dollar acoustic you know, from get the knockoff brand of the main brand. Like that's usually a good, <clears throat> like you can't get a, um, uh, a Gibbs, like a Gibbs, Gibson makes excellent acoustics too. I forgot to mention them. They're like notoriously famous for their, <laughs> their uh, acoustics. And you can get an Epiphone for like half the cost of a Gibson. There's entry level Epiphones. Fender has okay acoustics. They're better they're better for like a first um, electric, um, but I, I I even debate like I here's why Corey and I are different on this. When I learned guitar, I learned on a Synsonics, which was like pretty much a piece of plywood that you would order from a Sears catalog, and uh, that's what I learned how to play guitar on. And it was horrible. The tuners were plastic and like <clears throat> even were wiggly, so like. It, it, the plastic had actually disengaged from the metal like on it the plastic knob so it was like you'd have to like kind of pinch it to like really tune um and literally like i think the neck was plywood just spray painted black um it was terrible it was like the, the worst guitar ever but you know yeah i, I my, my point is like I, I think learn on something crappy then you'll appreciate the, the real thing Although Corey does have a good point. The second you get a real guitar <laughs> and you play it, you're like, oh, my fingers didn't have to bleed as much. <laughs> like, you know, because <laughs> I will tell you, like, um, I've played Squires like most of my life because I grew up poor. And so even when I had the money to buy a decent guitar, I was just like, nah, I don't need anything other than like a Squire. Right. And I finally just went all out and got like an American fender telecaster professional series and it is like it, it, it there's no comparison it's just like it it plays so beautifully however i think that would be dangerous as a first guitar because you do a lot of stupid things with the first guitar you're gonna break a string because you turn it the wrong way when you're tuning you're gonna wind your strings the wrong direction you know mm -hmm. um you're gonna do things you you might like mess with the guitar like to to fix the intonation which you really shouldn't you should have a pro set it up but but you're gonna mess with it and bang it around or drop it because you don't know like how to do the strap or anything like that like it's better to have some of the mid-range at the beginning i think but get a get a locking strap yes get, get a locking a strap. guitar <laughs> especially an electric um yeah because you know yeah <laughs> all right why this am I? Why are we talking about guitars? <laughs> who are we trying to sell a guitar to? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I do like the Teton, Teton guitars, and I actually like. I I have looked at that site uh, ever since you talked about it, and it's like it's really pretty incredible what that company does, and getting like the thing I like about a company like that is it's it's small and local, and and quite often like that's the kind of shop that's going to have like, like Corey just described, like they're going to have a personal luthier, like looking over your guitar and making sure everything's intonated and perfect, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's like a fourth generation family owned company in the middle of a rural Idaho. And I will say a lot of great acoustics are made in rural places. Like it's just kind of a, Oh, Oh no. Where'd you go? Oh, I, I I blinked out and I closed OBS and forgot that I was. So here we go. Glad my audio stuck around. So I I actually finished the uh, the panel I had to get done, and uh, 
I really do want. I don't know. I I I have to be careful with with guitars because that's a path where I could end up being that guy. I have too many guitars already. I don't need another guitar, but I but I'm always tempted to get another guitar. Yeah. So. But I, but I have been impressed by just the aging on my acoustics because both of my acoustic guitars, including the nice one, the Seagull, sounds 50 times better seven years later. The uh, the crappy $90 guitar that I got in like back in like 98, that thing sounds unbelievable. It's never sounded better. And, and it yeah. used to sound really bad. And it's weird how the... Like some guitars just have a great tone and it could be like the crappiest guitar in the world. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> I have a friend who has a really expensive, I, I talked about Epiphones being cheaper than Gibson's, but yeah. uh, the guy we record with sometimes and he, he he'll do masters of the songs I, I track. He has this Epson uh, 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 and um, did I say Epson Epiphone? Uh, acoustic that's like retails for like three or four grand and uh he he dropped it <laughs> oh a long ago i think it had something to do because he had his kid or something like it, it was a big accident and there's just a giant hole in it mm. on like the corner but the weird thing is it never had like a really great tone and he he literally like can't explain it, but he was like, dude, just try this guitar. And I played it and it was like the most beautifully intonated. Oh, is like, it is it in the is it in the upper? It's upper it's like corner? it's actually in the lower corner. It's just it doesn't make sense why it sounds better. It just does. And it, and it's well, a beautiful sounding guitar, and it's something about like the ding on it, uh just made it work. It's a really pretty resonant guitar, you know. There's some there's some luthiers that have been exper uh, experimenting over the years of putting holes in the in the corners of guitars because a lot of the sound gets trapped and dies there. Yeah, the Ovation thing. does that, right? Like mm -hmm. with their, yeah. their little side cuts, stupid plastic back guitars, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, they're pretty indestructible though, and the plastic yeah. back actually gives it a pretty resonant sound. Yeah, and I mean Ovation was really dynamic, especially when they first came out, because that is at least for the time that they came out. Now, a lot of guitars have kind of mimicked that shape and, and that style, but right. it was one of the first acoustic electrics that really sounded acoustic, yeah. like plugged in without having to be mic'd or have like a weird, you know, um, those are our beautiful guitar. There, there's a tone to it, but I still just, I don't know. I feel like, come on don't have a plastic back to your guitar <laughs> <laughs> like one of the most beautiful sounding ukuleles is this indestructible plastic ukulele that they call is that the box one no it's a boat paddle okay they call it a boat paddle the box ones are pretty cool too but they're made out of like cigar boxes oh i um, love cigar box stuff cigar box yeah. slide guitars are rad too <laughs> but the uh the boat paddles man it sounded amazing. And you could like beat them up against a brick wall. And it, it's just something about the, the type of plastic that they use. It just vibrates really well, but it's like really indestructible. Oh my and gosh. I want a boat pedal. Because one, one of the problems. I didn't know about these, Corey. Yeah. What? I don't want to get one. Boat oh, paddle. Boat paddle? Yeah. They're pretty cool. I haven't, I haven't looked them up in a long time. Oh my gosh. Okay. I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> I hey, notice, notice the sound hole on the boat paddles. Mm -hmm. Like like this one. It's, yeah, it's, it's such just, a trip. They're at the top. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like at the sides. Oh my um, goodness. Anyway, they sound great. Did you, you've, were you the person who told me about the horror story of the um, hateful eight? Hateful Eight. I don't. What, what's the story? okay? So there's a Tarantino flick called The Hateful Eight, and there is yeah. a sequence in which one of the characters, like there's a folk guitarist playing a guitar, and one of the characters smashes it. Oh. It turns out that that was like I think I think it was a Gibson, but it's like literally from the era they were f pretending to be in. It's a priceless guitar. 
Oh my gosh. And uh, somehow the double of the guitar and the actual guitar got mixed up and it was on loan from like a his historical museum. And so in that scene, they're literally destroying a priceless guitar. <laughs> that is the worst thing I've heard. And it was a big deal in the, uh, oh, it was a Martin. That's it. A priceless oh, yeah. Martin. And it was from like the early 1800s or something. Wow. And it was still in perfect playable condition. <laughs> That's really awful. And when oh I, I like myself a Tarantino flick, but um, <laughs> I, I think like every guitarist on the planet reading that was just like, Oh, like why yeah. would you do that? Oh, yeah man. that's yeah yeah that's not that's not great that's one of those things where like whoever's job was to swap those out between scenes you had one job <laughs> right yeah one job just make sure that this priceless piece of history <laughs> doesn't uh doesn't get smashed why would you bother using it in the first place yeah. Well, I mean, I can understand because they wanted the scene to be authentic. Uh, they made a deal with the museum. It, like, it does have a tone that's unmatchable. Yeah, you know? but why does it have to be on set? Use, use, record it. Yeah, or just like cut and then have them swap the guitars with the fake and break it. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Don't. Like. Yeah, because I guess that happens with films a lot, especially like films that are supposed to take place in like, you know, the old West or whatever, like a museum will do a loan of an actual, you know, thing. Right. But, you know, generally there's like a deal and a contract that you're not going to destroy priceless objects. Right. Oh, so anyhow, man, that's, that, that. if you ever see that movie, just know that was that was I, like I, I can't I can barely watch that scene. <laughs> That is incredibly sad. Oh, it's yeah. All right. So with that sad note, um, I'm gonna take off. Corey, have a good night. Yeah. Thanks. Have work. I think I might be done with uh, this part. I gotta ask you a question real quick. Somehow I've got to work in Wacom. In dude, that looks room. so cool, dude. Thank you. Let me. I'll go. I'll go full screen. I gotta, I gotta figure out how to work in like a like a Cintiq or a, a Wacom stylus pen or something, or the logo. I don't know. I might sleep on it. Yeah, that's a lot of work. The transitions work really well. I like that last transformation. Yeah, um, a lot different than I had anticipated originally. Um, but I feel like it works pretty well. I, I am a, a, a big fan of nonsense tech. Yeah, um, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's like one of those things. I think it's in the soul of anybody who grew up reading comics. Because <laughs> it's oh, like you see, rude. I didn't notice Phil. Phil is in the chat, man. What's up, Phil? How's Sorry. it going? I haven't, I haven't talked to that guy in a long time. He's a cool dude. He um, he does uh, he does a comic and uh, posted on posts a lot of his artwork on Instagram. Anyway, I I used to talk to him a lot more on Instagram. I haven't seen him recently. How's it um, going, Phil? Yeah, it can transform into a Cintiq or a Silas. Yeah, I was thinking of that. I don't know. I got all the. It'll come to me. Oh man! Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I gotta, I gotta call it myself. So, um, yeah, I thanks. think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna crank some tunes and, and go into a zone. So I think I'm gonna call it as well. Uh, if you want to check out Joshua Kemble stuff, go to joshuakemble.com. Um, he's got a book for sale. His book stories. So go buy that crazy. book. It's pretty awesome. And, uh, if you want to, if you want to check out my stuff, you can go to coreycurr.com. And, uh, thanks for hanging out everybody. 
it yeah. is it is late, so you should go to sleep or wake up or where wherever you are in the world. Um, anyway, go make stuff. We'll catch you later. Love it.